very much. Uh, my name is Davna Fleeson. I'm based at the CAB here in Madrid. And um, I'm working with colleagues both at the CAB and here at ESAC, um, looking at a site down in the south of Spain called Rio Tinto. And I'm investigating that site as a Mars analog. Uh, I know we're running late, and I'll try and keep this brief so we can get to coffee before too long. Um, the exploration of Mars by necessity operates in a very phased nature, um, punctuated by missions which are delivering uh, increasingly large volumes of higher and higher resolution data. Um, Earth-based observations uh, give us a sense of uh, global views of the surface of Mars, and then uh, orbital missions move, move forward to provide regional views of mineralogy and geomorphology. Um, the views of geomorphology and mineralogy um, that we gain from orbital missions are used to uh, provide information that feeds into landing site selection. And in recent years, this has really been driven by um, the, the desire to find places on the surface that could possibly uh, represent sites of past or present habitability. Um, this is generally indicated by the interactions of uh, minerals or geomorphological features that have been influenced by water. Um, it's not enough to find places that may have been habitable in, this, in the past, but uh, additionally we need to identify sites um, where any biosignatures, should they be present, um, would have the potential to be uh, preserved or possibly uh, excavated in um, more recent times. Um, the type of uh, challenges faced by in situ investigations can be hard to prepare for due to the number of unknowns that, are, uh, that is, exist for any of the environments in which the landers have, have investigated. Uh, these could include the um, chemical properties of the soil that were encountered by uh, the Viking experiments, or sorry, the, the, the mechanical properties of the soil that were encountered by Phoenix which had difficulties feeding in the cohesive, sticky soil uh, into the sampling mechanism and carrying out their analyses. Uh, the chemical properties encountered by the Viking life experiments in the 70s um, made it difficult to interpret the results of those experiments that were carried out due to the fact that the chlorate, a uh, very strong oxidant, was scavenging any organic materials that were present. And um, the way in which we can really help prepare for in situ investigations or to increase our readiness level is to identify sites on the earth um, that have in some ways environmental similarities to those on the surface of Mars. Uh, these could include places within the dry valleys of Antarctica, um, which could possibly act as analogies for subsurface lakes uh, within ice or uh, brine releases that we could identify on Mars. Uh, the Atacama Desert in Chile uh, also has the same kind of perchlorate um, chemistry that, that can operate to really mask the presence of organics on the surface. And these type of locations can facilitate hypotheses and hardware testing. Um, the data gained from these type of sites can be exploited to, to guide new mission design and to inform sampling strategies um, and to increase readiness to, to um, improve the, the possibility of mission success at these, low, at these uh, uh, sites on the surface of Mars. So analog studies provide context for the return data that we can uh, access through the planetary archive, and they can facilitate interpretation of results from these in situ analyses. Uh, analog studies also generate multidisciplinary and multi-scale data streams, which can be utilized to make comparisons with planetary data. So my field site down in the south of Spain, Rio Tinto, it's a 100 kilometer long acidic river, very, very rich in dissolved iron and sulfur. Rio Tinto just means red river, and the color of the waters here is, is very dramatic in this picture from uh, a field uh, visit a couple of years ago. The associated mineral deposits uh, that we see along the river range in age from a couple of million years to very ephemeral seasonal deposits. Uh, this can give us the opportunity not only to evaluate how these minerals might form, but also how they might be preserved or survive over um, geological timescales. There's a very active microbiology at the site playing a role in the mobilization of iron and sulfur within the system. 
Um, so in effect, the microbiology that's present is affecting the type of minerals that are deposited. And the Mars analogies for the site include the presence of uh, iron oxides, uh, ferric sulfates, and phyllosilicate deposits. So what I've been engaged in carrying out has been a scale integrated characterization of the study area. Um, on the first hand, I've been looking at the mineralogical characterization of the site, um, trying to relate orbital measurements to ground conditions, as we see on the surface, both through uh, field visits and carrying samples back to the lab and um, characterizing them uh, under laboratory conditions, um, with the objective of trying to provide insights into how compositional information is lost uh, over decreasing scales of resolution. Um, on the other hand, the geological uh, geobiological characterization I've been carrying out um, is trying to identify linkages between those microscopic microbial processes and the macroscopic mineral deposits that can be detected within satellite data. I'm interested in also identifying the scales at which the connections between microbiology and mineralogy can be established, um, providing target materials for astrobiological investigation that could be uh, targeted on the surface of Mars and provide contextual information on the kind of uh, substrates and environments that we can use to test um, instrumentation and techniques for biosignature identification. So uh, the work generates data streams over a range of scales. Uh, here on the left, I've got um, reflectance uh, spectra uh, across the, the visible and near infrared here across three different scales. Um, this lower spectrum here is, uh, corresponds to a pixel of Hyperion data. That's a hyperspectral imager uh, in orbit uh, around the Earth on, on EO1. It's actually the only hyperspectral imager in orbit around the Earth at the moment. Um, the second spectrum here is uh, a field uh, spectrum I collected using an ASD field spectrometer. And uh, the final one here is a lab spectrum that I collected using samples that I returned. So um, what we can use these reflectance spectra for is to identify minerals that are present within uh, the, the field sites across different scales. These can range again from the orbital through the field scale down to the laboratory scale. And uh, the picture of obviously uh, at the orbital scale is very simplistic. The, the Hyperion data that we have is uh, about 30 meters per pixel. Um, at the field scale, we're working on the order of um, maybe tens of uh, centimeters uh, spot size, and then within the lab, we have a spot size of a couple of millimeters. So the picture that we get is increasingly complex, of course, as we move to higher resolutions. But what we can do is to try and um, provide an idea or uh, a basis of comparison for the Mars data sets um, that are generated by rover uh, um, uh, and also by the, the orbiting spacecraft. Uh, we also generate uh, data streams across multiple disciplines. Here on the left, we have some uh, mineralogy uh, as established using X-ray diffraction. And <coughs> these X-ray peaks show the presence of sulfate and clay minerals in some of the samples that have been returned. Um, we can provide insights into biochemistry or the kind of organic content within the samples that are brought back to the laboratory using mid-IOR data, um, which show the presence of uh, protein stretches. And uh, finally, um, from a geobiological perspective, SEM imagery can reveal biominerals and extracellular components. Uh, so what we have are, are scales ranging from um, the orbital scale right down to the, the microscopic here, spanning about nine orders of magnitude. And we can trace mineralogical signals uh, right the way along. So how does the terrestrial analog data feed back into our characterization of uh, planetary environments? Well, the first is, as I mentioned, it can facilitate spe uh, scale comparisons. Here is a summary of the minerals that have been seen uh, across each scale for several of the field sites. And this is compared here to uh, three of the Mars landing sites, Meridiani, Gusev, and Gale. Um, and the resolution of Omega um, is uh, something like 100 meters per pixel, and then Chrism is, is more like um, maybe 10 to 20 meters per pixel. 
So the Hyperion data that we have for the terrestrial sites is intermediate between those two resolutions. So I was looking at both. Um, we don't have reflectance spectra for the, the rovers because uh, that kind of spectrometer wasn't included on the, on the, on the rovers, but we, we do have um, a lot of mineralogical detections based on other kinds of instruments. Uh, secondly, we can use the terrestrial data to compare directly with the Mars, Mars data to try and identify surface materials. Um, here we have uh, several of the average field spectra uh, of the sites that I was working with down in the south, and these are compared to units from uh, Gustav Gale and uh, Endeavour Crater. And some of the similarities we see include uh, visible iron absorptions in uh, the, the field spectral data that correspond quite closely um, with units from the Endeavour Crater. And uh, in, our, in our field data, these are, are generally um, representative of girthite hematite deposits, so that corresponds with what's been seen so far. And then here we have uh, uh, an absorption doublet at about uh, 2.3 microns in the, some of the laboratory data collect for Rio Tinto, uh, similar to those observed in the Mars layer deposits typically associated with phyllosilicates and sulfates. We can also generate biosignature libraries for different types of environments. Um, we sampled a range of different environments um, along the river, ranging from types of muds and sands. Uh, we can get a sense of what kind of organic signatures could be detected um, in those types of environments and also what kind of um, imaging data we can collect using microscopy. The kind of data that we generate can be used then to uh, feed back into our view of ExoMars landing sites. Um, we saw earlier a lot of exploration of the planetary data of uh, the landing sites, but what we can use this terrestrial uh, analog data for is to look at sites like Marth that are very clay rich. We can compare those to the clay samples that we collected um, that were particularly rich in organics. We can look at somewhere like Oxyoplanum, um, where iron, bear bar iron bearing phyllosilicates uh, are, compared, are uh, combined with jarosite signatures. And we actually saw the greatest concentration of organic and um, morphological biosignatures in environments along the Rio Tinto, uh, which had minerals including um, clay minerals and sulfates. Uh, so that's an indication that that might be a particularly interesting site. Um, within environments uh, where we have uh, grain size sorting, we can also look at the, the Rio Tinto data um, to observe that within areas such as muds and so on, we can um, we saw large amounts of uh, extracellular materials, uh, which could be used to potentially act as nucleation surfaces for biominerals and so on, which could increase the preservation potential of uh, biosignatures within those kind of environments. Uh, somewhere like Aram Dorsum, we can see an extensive fluvial network, um, which could also uh, offer a lot of similarities with the type of depositional environments we've seen in Rio Tinto. So what are the obstacles to carrying out comparisons between planetary and terrestrial data sets? Um, the first point is uh, involving the identification and sourcing of planetary data, and we've seen a lot of the various um, map searches and, and means of accessing the, the planetary data archive uh, earlier today. Um, I found the, uh, the global maps uh, released for the Omega data uh, that are available through Google Earth, very uh, useful for uh, getting a sense of the, the global uh, layout. Um, in terms of accessibility, uh, the CRISM data offered the advantage of uh, downloadable toolkits um, that slotted into Envy and uh, a lot of tutorials on how to use the data, so that tended to be the, the compositional information I was focusing on. Uh, manipulating the Mars data, the tutorials have uh, a range of steps through which you can step through uh, in order to identify spectra of interest. Um, despite the fact that the tutorial is quite detailed, it's still something of an art to draw out the useful spectrum uh, spectra. And uh, one of the potentially useful additions to a planetary archive would be um, to include spectra that have already been, been drawn out of the data and have been published and possibly um, create a repository of, uh, of those high-level products um, for use in, in future studies. 
In terms of archiving and sharing the terrestrial data sets, um, I have text files for spectral data. There's not currently uh, within the, the ESA planetary archive the facility to upload uh, data for, for um, terrestrial analogs, but this is maybe something that could be considered in the future, and we heard it in, in, uh, with reference to the, the PDS earlier on today. Um, in terms of GIS interface, uh, well, I, I, I use RGS to store my data, but I'd be interested in exploring some kind of web-based interface in order to be able to make this, these kind of data sets more shareable. Um, finally, in conclusion, I think that comparisons between uh, planetary and terrestrial data sets add value both to missions that have been concluded and also maximize the return from data generated during terrestrial investigations. Uh, some of the ways to facilitate these comparisons would be to include higher level data products within the archive. Uh, as I said, to possibly compile an archive of spectra included in publications. Um, possibly increase archive searchability by use of tags for mineralogy or, or um, publications which have referenced specific sites. <coughs> and finally, to promote, to promote user added data archives for terrestrial data sets. Thank you very much.